Hello everyone, thanks so much for being here. Today we are going to talk a little bit about different pathway programs, different options for you to explore if perhaps you're a little bit unsure about your future or you want to explore different paths for your academic journey in the US. We have our guests from three different universities. We have first Justin Dutram from University of Arizona. We have Michael Bossel from North Carolina State University and Yarubi Petitfrere from Felician University. Thank you everyone for being here, our guests and our participants, and of course our Education USA team, who is always there behind scenes making sure everything runs smoothly. This session is, as you may know by now, uh, is part of the regional efforts from the North America, Central America, and Caribbean region. We are doing all sorts of sessions that will benefit you as a student who's looking to pursue their higher education in the US. Make sure to explore the Facebook page of Education USA Guatemala, as well as the US Embassy in Barbados in Bridgetown, because we have different sessions there that can be of a contribution for your process and your elements to consider for your journey. So today the agenda is going to include, of course, our welcome. We're going to ask you where you're joining us from. We welcome everybody. You know, you may not be from this region, but you are welcome to tune in and learn all you can about the different content that we uh, offer as Education USA. We're going to talk briefly about what is Education USA, and then we'll move on to hear from our speakers and, all, and learn all the valuable information that they may have to share with us. Okay, so to begin with, um, I'm going to send a poll for uh, all, all of you joining through Zoom. You'll be able to answer this poll to tell us where you're joining us from. And if you are joining us on Facebook, you are welcome to share there where you're joining us from in the comment section. As part of the, of the you know, housekeeping items, remember we are running a live event and we are a couple people trying to make it you know, run smoothly. So make sure that if you're on Zoom, you let us know your questions in the chat box. You can address them to Elvira Castillo. She is a co-host in the Zoom session. And on the Facebook event, you can let us know in the comment section. We also have our colleagues uh, monitoring those questions. We will have a section for Q&A at the end of our webinar. So let's see where are people joining us from. Okay, we got Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. Welcome, everybody. This is uh, really, really fun, and, and we really appreciate your presence. Okay, so real, real, real briefly also, we will be sharing a survey in the chat box and in the comment section for you to share your contact info with us if you want to hear about other events that we have. Uh, as Education USA. So make sure that you, you keep track of that. And again, briefly, what is Education USA? We're your official source for higher education uh, in the US. We offer different types of services. We do one on one sessions, we do sessions like this, where we have guests from other accredited higher education institutions in the US. We do fairs and we do have upcoming events next week on July 13 and 15. We have sessions on evaluating if you're a good candidate for financial aid. So please stay tuned on our social media and make sure to also visit educationusa.state.gov to stay in the loop of the different events that we have and the different ways that we can support you in your journey. So today, like I said, we have three amazing guests and we will begin with Justin Dutram from University of Arizona. You can see there where is Arizona in the US and he will talk to us a little bit about the global campus program at University of Arizona. So welcome, Justin. Thank you very much, Maria Luisa. Uh, it's, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be here with everyone. 
I want to thank our, our friends at the Department of State and Education USA, of course, for the invitation to share a little bit of information today about uh, the Global Campus Program at the University of Arizona with, with our participants who are joining us. And it's great to see folks from Mexico, the Caribbean, and it looked like the vast majority were from Central America. But Central America is a lot of different countries, so it'd be great to know which countries they're, they're joining us from. Mostly Guatemala, maybe El Salvador, maybe even Panama. Uh, we'll have to maybe follow up with that afterwards to, um, to find out where they're, they're coming in from. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with everyone now. Um, hopefully that goes successfully. Fantastic. So I'm again, I'm Justin Dutram. I'm uh, Associate Vice President for Mexican and Latin American Initiatives here at the University of Arizona. And I'm attached to a unit called U of A Global, which is really our kind of international affairs office here at the University of, of Arizona, which also deals with international admissions. Uh, so very pleased again to, to be sharing the global campus experience with, with everyone on the, uh, on the video conference. So the I think everyone is aware of the reality. It's been with us now uh, for, for quite some time, uh, starting back in March. And really when things uh, began to change for the University of Arizona was right around spring break, so the middle of March. And at that time here at the university, we began to look at you know, what was gonna be coming down the line. Uh, so if we think about international students in general around the globe, um, so we know that there are 5 million students generally who have some kind of international mobility from year to year. Uh, if we look at, um, let's say Mexico, we have folks from Mexico online. There are about 15,000 students from Mexico who leave Mexico to study abroad every year. Most of them come to the United States, some to Canada, some to other countries in Europe. Uh, so there's a significant amount of international mobility that we knew was going to be impacted by the new reality that the pandemic has, has brought us. And as uh, the headlines continue to roll out, we know that things are, are still very much up in the air for the fall semester for most institutions uh, here in the United States. Um, we're looking at either going completely to online instruction, some universities will be um, coming back to campus, but I think most will have a combination of one or the other, some kind of hybrid instruction model where we can get some students back to campus and do some online instruction. But that really doesn't solve all of the problems for students who are still abroad. Um, many students who are abroad are not going to be able to uh, get visas on time. Uh, we know that the embassies and consulates uh, in most countries are not yet giving appointments for, for student visas. The airlines are running completely. So how can we serve students such as yourselves who are in other countries that may have had goals to come to the United States to study in August uh, and provide you with an opportunity that would let, that let, would let you stay on track, uh, whether you were planning to come to the University of Arizona, which would be great, or even considering uh, another institution within the US or Canada. So that's really the concept of, of Global Camp. And we began to pull it out at the end of March and have uh, developed a significant number of international partnerships that allow us to serve students in a, in a very unique way. Uh, which I'll detail as we go forward. So just a little bit about the University of Arizona. Uh, we're one of three public universities in Arizona. Uh, so we have two sister institutions, one in Flagstaff, which is Northern Arizona University, uh, one in Tempe, which is Arizona State University, and then the University of Arizona, our institution, which is in Tucson. Uh, generally, we're ranked within the, the top 1% of uh, at, uh, higher education institutions uh, throughout the world. Um, top 100 as well uh, from the US News and World Report. In terms of our uh, research enterprise, uh, we're ranked number 20 for public research institutions. So the University of Arizona is considered to be what's called the research one institution as defined by, uh, by Carnegie. Uh, so we have significant um, uh, research enterprises, especially in, in optical sciences and space sciences and astronomy, uh, water, we have two medical schools. Uh, so research is a very big part of the 
uh, undergraduate and graduate experience at the University of Arizona. And then also significantly, uh, our online uh, branch, Arizona Online, is ranked number 11 uh, by US News and World Reports. So we have a very robust online mm. offering. Uh, so I think the, um, Maria Luisa already shared with everyone where, where Tucson is, uh, but just to give you a, a, a maybe a more detailed idea. So Arizona is in the southwestern part of the United States, very close to California. Uh, Tucson's in the southern part of the state at uh, an elevation of about 800 meters. Uh, right now it's very warm in Tucson. Uh, Phoenix is a much larger city than Tucson. That's about 5 million people. And of course, everyone knows Arizona for the Grand Canyon. Just to give you a little bit of geographic uh, reference for, for where we are located. Um, located right in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, which is the most biodiverse region uh, in uh, the US. Uh, so a little bit about Tucson, just so you can know where we're, where we're at. So it's a mid-sized city, a little bit over a million inhabitants. Uh, we're renowned for the diversity of <laughs> we have in the city. Of course, the natural environment of the Sonoran Desert. And then also known for uh, innovation and technology. We have a very large number of enterprises dedicated to, uh, to space and, and, and space exploration and aerospace within uh, Tucson. Of course, mining and mining innovation is a big part of the economy in Arizona as well. Uh, just a few other uh, data points. It's very hot in Tucson right now. We're about 43, 44 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's pretty warm. We have a lot of sunshine throughout the year. Uh, so it's warm in the summer, hot in the summer, I would say, but nine months out of the year, we have beautiful weather in, in Tucson and you can be outside all year round. Um, one great thing to, to take away is that Tucson was the first city in the United States that was designated as a uh, UNESCO creative city, city of gastronomy, uh, which speaks a lot about the diversity of cultures that we have and the uh, the fact that we've been cultivating food in, in Tucson for over 3,000 years and we've got a great uh, gastronomic tradition being so close to, to Mexico as well. So just a little bit of background on the city and institution itself. Um, so coming back to the idea, how do we serve students right now in dealing with the pandemic, dealing with travel restrictions, dealing also with the economic impacts that we know the pandemic uh, is having worldwide. So there are very few people who will uh, very few families that will not have been impacted in some way economically by uh, the situation that we're living through. Uh, so the Global Campus Experience tries to address all of those factors. Uh, so what the Global Campus is, is you have a partnership between the University of Arizona and a local institution. Uh, so it may be a university, it may be a co-working space or an incubator, uh, and it may also be an educational services provider. Uh, but the idea is that a student could take online coursework with the University of Arizona and also have an on-campus experience at a partner institution. So students who participate in the global campus are admitted as, fully admitted as, as students into the University of Arizona. There's no difference between online and in-person classes. Uh, the modality, of course, is different, but they're accredited in the same way. So if you get a diploma from the University of Arizona that you completed all of your coursework online, it's the exact same diploma as if you were on, on campus. Um, so the options for the students are, you can also develop what we call customized degree programs or transfer pathways. Uh, so if your initial uh, objective in August was to go to another college or another university in the United States or Canada and you're unable to do that, you could begin study with the University of Arizona in August, accumulate credits for one semester, maybe a year, maybe even up to two years, and then you can take those credits, the vast majority of those credits will go with you into your program of study at the institution that you had originally planned to to attend, but we're unable to because of the circumstances. Uh, so that would be the first option, the customized degree programs. The second option would be the global campus itself where you can do a full degree online. So the idea is that you'll be able to have the academic side with a on-campus experience once campuses open up uh, around the world with our, our partner institutions. And I'll go into a little bit of detail about that in, in the next couple of slides. Of course, the University of Arizona also offers many dual degree programs with partners throughout the world through our microcampus network. 
It's not really the topic here, but just they're available and they're also something that we're working towards with our global campus partners in, in Latin America and in other regions in the world. And then our, our online branch, Arizona Online, is of course available to, to students throughout the world being online. Uh, but it is set up a little bit differently. What we're able to do through Global Campus is offer students a, a much more competitive price point through by being able to offer scholarships to international students who enroll in, in Global Campus. So the Global Campus experience offers quality and convenience, uh, especially in a time uh, where options may be limited uh, for either initiating or continuing studies in the fall semester. Uh, so students can have access to a top-ranked Arizona online program with discounted pricing. And talk a little bit about prices in general, but I know that we have uh, attendees from many different countries, so I'm happy to address those questions uh, through the chat. Uh, and it also gives students access to a partner campus where they'll have access to internet, libraries, co-working spaces. Uh, they'll be able to participate in cultural and, and sports programs. The offer will vary depending on the institution, but the idea is that a student will be fully integrated into the educational community at our partner institutions while they're doing their coursework with the University of Arizona online. Uh, so they get a unique in-person college experience with the convenience of an online education. And really this is for students who uh, who are unable to study abroad right now and we're thinking even for fall semester, August, September, but desire a U.S. education, this gives you an option to begin accumulating academic credit or to complete a, uh, a degree program with the University of Arizona at a reduced cost. So I did mention customized degree paths. This, these are the transfer pathways. So if you wanted to come in and take take classes that would apply to your major um, or your course of study at even at other institutions. The classes that we're, we're offering are, are generally very transferable. Uh, they're fully accredited. So these are personalized programs. So a student who enrolls in a customized degree path would meet with an enrollment counselor, talk about their, 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 their goals um, through their, their degree program, and we would be able to customize the course offering to, to meet those goals. Uh, there's definitely a lot of flexibility if you haven't decided upon your major yet. You can stay in the customized degree pass for up to two years. After two years, you really need to be in your major and, and it becomes more and more difficult to transfer. I think most folks are aware of that. Uh, so these are University of Arizona courses and the on-campus experience that would be offered at the partner institution. This is only at the bachelor's level. We can't do customized degree pathways at the graduate level because of the nature of graduate programs. And I should mention that we do offer a very competitive scholarship uh, program for both the customized degree pathways and for global campus. For students who are enrolled in a, a degree program through global campus, we have a very special offer that is called Study Arizona that allows students who are enrolled in Global Campus to come to our main campus at the University of Arizona in Tucson for the same tuition that they would pay through Global Campus. Uh, so talking a little bit about price points for international students, uh, in general, non-resident tuition for international students and, and non-resident students, if you're from California or you're from Chile, this, this would be the same price is $36,000 a year roughly. Uh, the online offerings are, are 15,000 and we're talking tuition. We're able to offer scholarships that bring the price down from $15,000 to a very competitive price, even within the local markets that we're, we're present in. So I'd be happy to talk about what the price points are in the specific countries that, that each of you um, are, are joining us from. Uh, so you're able to come to, to, to study full-time one semester at the University of Arizona for the same price that you would pay through the global campus experience. Of course, travel and living expenses are separate from that, but the tuition is generally the, uh, the largest item in terms of cost for, for students. Uh, there's a lot of detail on this slide, but suffice it to say that there are a number of options for undergraduate pathways. 
I'll direct you to a website where you can see which kind of pathways we can customize programs for. And then we have the undergraduate degree programs. There are over 40 undergraduate degree programs available fully online uh, through the global campus. And then we also have graduate programs as well. So there are a number of uh, fully online master's degree programs, uh, some in engineering, some in business, some in law, uh, some in social and behavioral sciences. Uh, we have some doctoral programs that are available completely online. I think education leadership is, is something that's generally of interest around the world. And then we have a number of graduate certificates, which are generally between 12 and 15 credits. And they are really for folks who may already be in the professional, in their professional careers, but are looking for something additional to add to their, their CVs, a new accreditation. Um, they're generally nested within a, a master's degree program as well. Uh, so all of the offering that I showed you is available fully online. And we have a couple of options for admissions. Uh, so I'm you know, not gonna go through all of the details here, but I will point you to a website, um, everywhere.arizona.edu. And there's a tab there for, for how to apply uh, to these programs. So it's generally the same admissions requirements we have for uh, on-campus students who would traditionally come to, to campus in Tucson. There's not many differences. The one thing I will point out for, for the folks who are joining us from, from, from countries where English is not uh, generally the, the language of, of daily use, um, if you attend a bilingual high school or you've done other coursework in English, generally that can, um, that can take the place of an English language test such as TOEFL or, um, or, or the other tests that, that are required for, for admissions. So there's some details here for undergraduate admissions, uh, graduate admissions as well. Um, so again, I'll direct everyone to everywhere.arizona.edu how to apply. And here is the contact information for my colleague, Mr. Humberto Fierro, who uh, is the admissions counselor uh, for Mexico and Latin America and the Caribbean. And he has a WhatsApp account. And of course, you can also look, uh, contact him through email and through the uh, everywhere.arizona.edu uh, website. Uh, so really quickly, this is where we have global campus partners in Latin America. Uh, so in Argentina, uh, we have two sites in Buenos Aires. In Bolivia, we're partnering with Universidad de Valle in Valle. In Brazil, we're partnering with the co-working space in Sao Paulo. In Chile, with Universidad Mayor and, and two other partners within Santiago as well. In Central America, we're working very, very closely with ULACIT, uh, which uh, the main campus, of course, is in San Jose, but they also have campuses in Panama and, and certainly attract students from out Central America. So I would love to talk to students if they have questions about uh, the program with ULACIT, but also uh, we're working in Ecuador with, with Universidad de las Américas. And in Mexico, we're working with Tec de Monterrey uh, so students who uh, maybe anywhere throughout the country, if there's a Tec de Monterrey campus in, in your city, uh, you would be able to have the global campus experience uh, with, with Tec de Monterrey and the University of Arizona. UPAEP in Puebla, we're also working with an incubator, Startup Mexico, uh, which has seven sites throughout Mexico. Of course, the largest one is in Mexico City, and also a study abroad provider in Merida, and finally, where we have a micro campus site in Peru with the Universidad Peruana de Ciencias Aplicadas. So those are the sites that are currently available in, in Latin America. And we expect to, to open additional uh, global campus uh, sites in the fall uh, once we have launched successfully the, the fall semester. So that's a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Uh, so I am happy to answer questions once we get to the question and answer portion of the, uh, the session. And with that, I'll turn it back uh, to you, Maria Luisa. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Justin. Um, thanks so much for sharing about University of Arizona. And now we'll hear from Michael Bossel from North Carolina State University which is in Raleigh, North Carolina. Take it away, Michael, thanks so much. Thank you, Maria Luisa. 
Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and to meet with you all virtually. Uh, I am, uh, I, uh, like Justin, I work in the international uh, department at the university, but I do not work in the admissions office. I'm not a student recruiter. Uh, my job is to help students be successful in wherever they go and whatever they do. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, my university at the end. Um, but um, uh, I'd like to give you some advice. Uh, I've advised uh, tens of thousands of international students over the last 40 years of my career uh, at numerous universities uh, in the United States and overseas. And it's a very interesting time uh, to be in international education and to think about studying abroad. You know, there, are, there are more than 3,000, almost 4,000 universities in the United States. So if you're thinking about studying in the United States for your college degree, you have many, many choices. And it's a little exciting, it's a little stressful, uh, but how do you decide? How do you decide where to go and what program is the best for you? There are many different reasons that people use uh, and there are many, many good schools. Uh, one of the nice things about U.S. education is you, you can make changes. Uh, you can uh, start something and if you don't like it, you can change to another degree or to another college. And the webinar tonight really is about pathways. So when we talk about pathways, it, we're talking about stepping stones, uh, things that you can do to try something before you make a commitment, uh, something that you can uh, build on. Maybe you don't know where you want to study or what you want to study. Many students uh, in the U.S. change their mind. They change their major. When I was a college student, I changed my major three times and ended up doing something very different. Even though I knew I wanted to be an architect. And for my first three years in college, I studied architecture. And then at the end, my fourth year, I said, I'm not a very good architect. I don't want to be an architect. <laughs> I'll never be successful as an architect. So I decided to uh, do something else. So I changed my major. Uh, so there's, there's no big mistakes. Uh, if, you, if you think about your options, you, you get a lot of good advice and you try certain things. So uh, you heard about some of the pathways that um, uh, you, know, you, you have at uh, University of Arizona. And uh, there are a few pathways that we have at North Carolina State University, but I won't just talk about our university, but a couple of other ideas that you might want to think about. So one thing you might want to think about that you can do now before you even apply to college uh, is engage in some short-term programs. Um, as Justin said, many schools are putting things online. Some of us have been offering online courses for many years, but now everybody's trying to offer online courses. Uh, some of them are very large. Uh, some of them can be very small. Uh, but there are other programs as well, research programs, uh, and I'll also talk a little bit about community colleges. So for short-term programs, uh, many times uh, students can come to a university for, uh, in person for a short-term program. That didn't happen this summer uh, because most of our campuses were closed. Uh, but next summer, uh, you can go to a program uh, six weeks, two weeks, uh, the whole summer. Uh, and you can actually try uh, the campus. You can understand and get a feel for the campus. U.S. high school students do this all the time. They visit campuses and universities have visitation programs to have the students check them out to see if they uh, like the feeling of it, if they like the athletic facilities, the recreation center, the library, et cetera. Uh, so you can visit different campus, different universities. Many universities have summer programs that you can consider. Uh, some are open enrollment. You can go by yourself. Uh, sometimes schools, high schools or uh, organizations have a, send a group of students. Uh, and at my university, we, we do both. Uh, we also have virtual online programs now. Uh, and you can do um, uh, study a, a number of different subjects. Uh, of course, e English uh, is a very common program. If you need to work on your English a little bit, you might want to consider doing an English program in the summer to boost your, your English language score. But if you're interested in entrepreneurship or leadership or business or uh, social involvement or politics, look for a summer program online or in person next summer. 
that is interesting to you. And remember, if you do anything like that, you can add that to your, your profile, your portfolio for your college application. Because if you go to a very competitive program, you know, some large universities get tens of thousands of applications. How do they choose? Well, they look for interesting people. Most people have good grades. Most people go to good schools. They have good TOEFL scores or IELTS scores, but you want to stand out. One way you can stand out is by telling them that, yes, I've studied in, in the United States before. I did a summer program in California or New York or Florida. That tells the admissions counselor that you have initiative, that you have interest, and that you have experience. So you're probably going to do okay at their university. So think about that. Um, online programs uh, are a little bit newer. Uh, you might think about uh, taking classes. There are some free MOOCs. Um, maybe MOOCs aren't for you. You know, a MOOC might have 5,000 students uh, taking the class. Uh, Harvard and MIT both offer classes for free uh, that you can take. Uh, if you want a smaller program, a lot of universities are now offering uh, virtual online classes that you can take. Some are for credit, some are not for credit. Um, but there are a lot of non-degree programs where you don't have to go through a long, complicated admission uh, process. You can sign up. And uh, I, I took a, a Harvard online course. Uh, it took me five minutes to sign up. I didn't have to demonstrate anything. Uh, they, they even let me in. Um, but some of the virtual and online programs are uh, high tech. We, we do a lot of virtual reality uh, in, in our, our programs. Uh, but sometimes it's just a professor you know, talking on the phone, uh, on the computer, uh, and sometimes you can do things uh, with groups as well. There, again, there are a lot of choices. Uh, if you want to take a course that's for credit or not for credit, uh, you might like the anonymity of uh, asynchronous courses where it's a video and you watch the video and you don't have to interact that much with students. Other online courses are very interactive. Most of ours are hybrid courses, so it's a combination of some online material, but you also have live face-to-face -face time with the faculty member and you engage with students uh, through groups and things. So those experiences will let you meet other American students, other international students, see if you like the faculty, see if you like the level, if you're ready uh, for that type of program. Um, but there are, again, different costs. Some of them are very expensive. Some of them are free or, or very cheap. So you need to do a little bit of homework and a little bit of research um, for that. Speaking of research, uh, another thing you might want to consider is, is to do research. Uh, a lot of high schools in the United States are having students, their high school students do research. Universities love students with research experience uh, at the undergraduate level. And of course, many graduate programs are research-based as well. So all of our undergraduate students are encouraged to do research. Uh, at the university, just as they're encouraged to study abroad and to do internships, et cetera, because it makes them a, a much more uh, well-rounded professional, ready for industry, more attractive to employers, um, et cetera. So uh, right now at, at NC State, we have 100 different students from around the world who are doing research with us. Normally, they would be physically with us for the summer in the lab laboratories engineering labs, science labs, but also the social sciences and college design and agriculture. Uh, a lot of different fields uh, support research opportunities for students. Uh, this year uh, is virtual. Uh, we didn't think that you could have a lot of virtual research experiences, but we had a lot of interest, so much interest. We actually had to work with some of our uh, neighboring universities like Duke University and University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, which are our neighbors. Uh, so we now have students that are doing research with them as well, which is great because they might have research opportunities that we don't offer at NC State University. So this is another way to, to show the admissions office that you're a serious student, uh, you're, you're, you're different, you have initiative, and, um, and then you, you get to taste or try the, the university. So here's a few more uh, uh, options uh, or benefits. Uh, that come out of research and, and internships. Uh, research is typically in the laboratory, but there are also internships uh, that you can do um, after you are in college or uh, even beforehand. So we have had uh, high school groups come to Raleigh, North Carolina uh, for short-term programs, for uh, English language programs, uh, for leadership programs, cultural programs, 
and also uh, service learning and, and research programs as well. Something that you really should consider uh, is uh, community colleges. Now, technical schools are different in different countries, uh, but community colleges are fabulous. We love the 56 community colleges in North Carolina. As a matter of fact, one third of all of our new students uh, at NC State come from the community college. They start taking their classes at community college. They might take a year or two years there, and then they transfer in. We make it very, very easy for them. So there's three types of programs that are at community colleges. One is um, uh, an associate's degree. You can get a two-year associate's degree, typically with the idea that you will transfer as a junior, as a three-year student at a university. There are technical training programs and certification programs, and then there's also continuing education. Most community colleges in the United States, there, there are, again, many varieties, but they will have two or all three of those types of programs there. And uh, you may want to consider, especially if you don't know where you want to go, uh, this may be a very, very good option for you. Or if you don't get admitted to your top favorite five colleges, well, think about going to community college. Their uh, application deadlines are usually later. Uh, the English test requirements are usually lower. Uh, the GPA requirements are usually a little bit lower, but uh, uh, you get almost the same quality education or sometimes better. Uh, if you go to a large university as a freshman, you might be in a chemistry class with 300 students and a, and a teaching assistant who's not a professor, you know, it's a teaching assistant teaching you chemistry classes. If you go to the community college, you're gonna get a professor who's teaching chemistry. But it's a great way to uh, ease into uh, a, a college program. It also is much less expensive. So one of my, I have three kids who went to college. One of them went to a residential college program. One of them went to a community college. Uh, and one of them is an online, uh, got an online degree. So even in my family, with my children, they took three different paths uh, to get their college degree. So there's a very large community college in about, I don't know, about 20 kilometers from our campus. They have 80,000 students and, and hundreds of programs. But we have, they teach the same courses uh, in the college preparatory program that we do. Same textbooks, sometimes it's the same faculty members. Uh, the nice thing is, Students can go there, it's, it's one third to one half the cost. They can try different things. And as long as they finish the program, then they can be admitted into NC State. The nice thing is, it's much easier to get admitted as a junior transfer than as a freshman. Uh, the other thing is we have advisors at the community colleges around us that help make sure you are successful. They answer your questions, they advise you which courses to take and they help, help you through the process. Uh, the other thing is, it's a two year trial because the credits will transfer into the university and you still get the NC State degree, but you don't bring your grade points with you. So if you make Bs and Cs in your first two years, uh, you, get a, you start over. Uh, when you're a, a junior, you start at NC State in your third year, uh, you have the credits and you only need two more years to finish, but you start over with your GPA, which was very helpful for my son because he was what we call a late bloomer. He wasn't that serious of a student. He didn't study very hard. Um, I didn't know if he was going to finish, uh, but he kept at it and, uh, and he, he did very well. So as a parent who was paying for the tuition, uh, I was very happy for my son to go to the community college uh, and get a great education. So uh, the last two slides are just about the um, uh, NC State, we do a lot of the, the things that I just mentioned. We're not the only one. Uh, if you have family or friends or you always wanted to study in Austin or California or Florida, that's understandable. But there are a lot of other places that you can consider. Places that might be uh, the climate is better, pace of life is nicer, might be safer. You know, if you want to live in a study in a big city, well, there are a lot of universities in big cities. We're not a big city. We're less than 1 million people uh, in Raleigh. Um, and it's a, a beautiful state. I will show you two, two pictures. Uh, 
the picture on the left is our, our main campus where some, uh, seven of our colleges are. The picture on the right is our Centennial campus where our College of Engineering is and the College of Textiles. And the buildings in the background are, is our capital city, that's uh, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. But anyway, uh, I'll stop here and, and pass the mic back to um, uh, our friends at Education USA and I'll be happy to answer any questions. If you do have questions, uh, my email is there. You can email me directly and I can direct you to the admissions office or some other place. But good luck, best wishes in your search and get lots of good advice. Uh, ask your friends, your family, Education USA advisors. Um, you know, most of us the universities, we want you to apply to the right program. You know, NC State is not for everybody. Uh, it is the best place for some people. Uh, so if you're one of those people, we would love for you to apply. Uh, if you belong somewhere else, then we wish you all the best. So thank you very much. Buddy, Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks so much for the valuable information um, that you shared with us uh, from NC State University. Very interesting. And now, last but not least, we have Yerubi Petit Frere from Felician University over there in New Jersey. We go to the east, to the northeast. Take it away, Yerubi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria Luisa. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm very excited to be here and to speak with you. Um, to give you a little bit of background, I'm from Panama. Originally, I was an international student just like you many, many, many moons ago. <laughs> and I went to the U.S. Uh, actually with an, uh, looking to improve my English and, um, you know, went to higher ed and graduated from with an undergraduate and, and, and master's degree in the U.S. So I really value the education and I think I can kind of understand a bit of what you're going through when you're looking for a good program for you. Uh, like uh, my colleague Michael says, it really is about the best fit. Uh, not one, you know, one size is not going to fit all of you, uh, but we hope that one of, the, one of us <laughs> will be the shoe that fits for you, which is fantastic. Um, I want to talk to you first a little bit of just overall in general, what, you know, what are pathway programs? And my colleagues have given really great examples from the universities, uh, which is uh, great, uh, some really concrete examples. But I'll talk a little bit more in general, in general terms and then get into some examples that we have at Felician as well and give you more details as well. Um, so I'll just get started. So, you know, you might have heard the, the term, right, pathway, but what does it really mean? Um, it is a stepping stone, but there's different kinds of stepping stones. So I'll go through the different types of pathway programs. For the most part, pathway programs, it is, you know, they're supposed to be a step, a short-term kind of um, uh, experience where you can learn a little bit more about what you're getting into <laughs> before you actually get into your program. Um, often pathway programs have a direct relationship to perhaps the university that you dream of going to. Uh, maybe you miss some of the requirements or you're just, your English is not quite there to meet the requirement of the university. So sometimes pathway programs, and I'll talk about specifically a little bit more later um, about the different types, um, but they can give you a good, good kind of insight uh, or, or pathway or um, what do I call it? Um, a good road into the into your dream university. So um, it's a good opportunity for those students that sometimes, oh, I miss one thing to get into this university, but you know there might be another another way for you to to achieve that dream. Um, and English is usually one of the biggest ones, and one of the biggest reasons why students start with pathway programs. It's, uh, pathway programs are also great if you maybe meet all the requirements, but you want to strengthen that English. You, get, you want to get to learn a little bit more about American culture before getting into your degree program. Um, so again, it's, it's a good way to kind of test the waters before you get really serious about your education uh, or, or into your degree program. Uh, sometimes it also gives you a little more time to kind of choose the pathway that you want to finish at or your end goal. So you may be considering a few programs or a few majors. So a pathway program might give you a good insight, especially if they have it at a, at a particular university to kind of see and live and listen uh, to uh, students in that major are saying uh, to give you an insight. So again, another opportunity to learn more about um, the place that you want to be. 
Um, often pathway programs, like I mentioned, are directly uh, on the university or institutions or college campuses, um, but not always. Um, uh, like uh, my colleague Michael talked a little bit earlier, a lot of different types of um, institutions offer English camps where uh, you, know, you, can, you can just have a fun way to learn the language and more usually more um, uh, speaking, you know, to practice more of the speaking side. It's not, you know, usually not a, a very rigorous ac academic, uh, but high school uh, camps are a good idea or a good experience for you to, um, to see what it means to learn English in the US and to practice it a bit more in the speaking world. Okay, um, a lot of times you might see pathway programs through what we call third party English pathway schools. Um, there might be, uh, you know, there's some popular ones out there, some big ones like ELS or EF or uh, that you might read about. Um, and, you know, there are accredited uh, English institutes. Um, and there's some advantages and disadvantages to those programs. Um, some of the advantages like I post here is, you know, gives you the flexibility, especially if you have a lower English level, but your dream is really to study in the US. Uh, a lot of these third party um, schools will actually offer English from zero, from very low levels where you can really uh, practice your English skills while you still get prepared for that academic English that you need to get into the university. Uh, a lot of these third party um, uh, providers will also offer you or help you get uh, the requirements that you need to get that conditional admissions uh, that you need for that university. And I'll talk a little bit more about what conditional acceptances are uh, in my next slide. Um, and sometimes uh, if they have a, a direct agreement with the university that you're looking to go to, uh, they will exempt you, this, uh, they exempt you from any TOEFL or IELTS that might be required uh, to get into the university. Sometimes, not always, but many times uh, once you finish, let's say, one of these ESL programs, it guarantees that you meet the English requirements that are necessary to get into the university that you're looking to go for college. Um, some of the disadvantages, like yes, they can be a little more pricey uh, in their costs than maybe a program that a university or community college might offer you. Um, they do charge usually for these kind of counseling services to help you get into the university or school that you want to go to. Um, and yes, the, at the end, you're not going to receive a, a visa or I-20 from the university that you're looking for. Uh, but, um, you know, again, it, it's easily transferable uh, once you get through their program. Okay, what is conditional admissions? Uh, and really the definition, um, it just gives you the ability to get into that degree program. So whether it's undergraduate or graduate or even doctorate, um, but maybe you missed uh, your, or you're kind of a little bit short in one of the admissions requirements that the university or institution is looking for. So having a conditional admissions, it's uh, allowing you to, yes, get uh, kind of pre-approval for you to be part of this program, uh, pending that you, that you fulfill certain requirements. Um, usually, again, they tend to often, or especially for international students, our language. So you need, maybe you miss the test score or the TOEFL score by a few points and you're close enough. So they allow you to uh, still be admitted into the degree pending that you, you know, uh, strengthen your English before you enter the program or while you're in the program. Um, sometimes there are academic conditions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that next, uh, what those mean if you're you know, admitted into a university pending an academic requirement. Um, and um, you know, acceptance, is you sh the, the nice thing is in the end is that you are admitted. <laughs> you have met most of the requirements, at least academic requirements um, uh, to, you know, get into the program that you are interested in pursuing. Uh, but it just means that you have to complete one more step before you are uh, officially into the program fully. Um, on, um, sometimes you hear um, universities or institutions offer bridge programs. Um, that's kind of another, another term for conditional admissions, to be honest. Um, and often, um, they tend to mean mostly because you're missing an academic requirement. So sometimes, for example, and, and nursing, it's, it's, it's a uh, kind of a good example for Felician. 
Uh, we often you know, find brilliant students that have really good GPAs, but the nursing department is looking that you, that you have that chemistry class. And maybe your high school didn't offer it, but your SATs are very good and your, um, you know, your GPA is good for you to get in. So we're gonna allow you to come into the nursing program pending that you do a chemistry class within your first semester. So that's, that's, a, that's, that's what we would call kind of a bridging you into the program. Um, and once you submit or once you finish uh, that, that prerequisite, then you can get into officially into the nursing program. Um, sometimes, you know, universities, uh, a lot of universities uh, do what's called a, um, a review of your background that's holistic. Um, and that means that although you may have a lower GPA or poor academic record, um, means you can still be admitted into the university, but with a condition or with a bridge program. Um, so sometimes that's when that is offered. Um, and you see this, I won't mind go into the next one too much because it tends to happen more in the British or Indian system. If, uh, if you're looking for a postgraduate program, um, but you only you know, completed a three-year bachelor's, um, a lot of this will give you, again, a bridge program where you can take some credits to meet the requirements to get into the master's degree. Because in the U.S., you need to have uh, four, four years worth of credits um, to get into most master's degree programs. Um, so here are some examples of what I mentioned. Uh, you might see uh, other kind of academic bridge programs, such as four plus ones where you get the opportunity to do a bachelor's degree plus in one year also complete an MBA. Um, they don't usually use that term, but that is really what they are. It's a, it's a bridge program for you to do a master's degree uh, combined with an undergraduate degree. And it's a bridge because during your senior year of your undergraduate degree, you start taking classes in your master's degree. So then you can complete the program um, faster. Um, you also see this from university to university, three plus two programs or two plus two programs, or like Michael mentioned, the community college into university programs. These are all types of academic bridge programs, allowing you to complete part of the program at one university with guaranteed uh, admissions into the next part of your program at another university, as long as you meet, you know, a certain GPA or all the academic requirements. So I think it's, it's just, giving you a good idea of what these terms mean um, because they might be sometimes used interchangeably um, and often kind of overlap in their descriptions. Now to tell you a little bit about Felicia and I'll give some examples of, of some of the um, some of the pathways that I've been describing. Um, Felicia is a, is a small university. Uh, we have 2,400 students. Uh, it's a liberal arts university, like um, I mentioned, we are in New Jersey, uh, right in Rutherford, New Jersey, uh, and often students describe us as really the, uh, the best of both worlds, um, because we are, if you look at our website and see some of the videos, we're your typical traditional kind of American um, neighborhood, you see lots of very residential campus, very safe. We were voted safest in all of New Jersey, safest campus. Uh, but it's the best of both worlds because we're only 16 kilometers from Manhattan, from New York. And we have a train station just a few uh, minutes from walking from campus. Uh, so whenever you want to kind of experience the, uh, everything that New York City has to offer is right at your footsteps. Um, but also, uh, you know, it gives you a lot of opportunities for work. Uh, internships, but you still have a quiet and a fun place, good community to learn. Um, and we offer a lot of these kind of programs where you can do a five-year uh, program, a five-year MBA um, with your undergraduate program or a master in computer science, um, you know, combined with your undergraduate in five years or a master in, in counseling psychology in six years. Uh, we're, um, we have more than 60 majors, over 60 majors in many different um, uh, disciplines, uh, over four schools, but Felician was founded as a nursing school. Uh, we are a Catholic institution uh, by the Felician Sisters. Um, it's not a religious school by any means, but that means that um, our students are really a taught from day one and for every single uh, every class that they take that they have to be good citizens uh, they're required to do community service and help others 
and you really feel that throughout the the, the classes that you take. Um, I'll move on a little bit from here. Another just quick highlight is that yeah, because our students we have a very very high placement rate which means that students have uh, jobs or they go on to grad school within six months uh, of their graduation. So we really focus on not only the education, but given the opportunity of internships and uh, I'd say outside activities. <laughs> uh, we have a, a very fan a fantastic UN program as well. We're one of, only one, one of 34 universities that is part of the United Nations. So students get the opportunity to intern and, and learn uh, how to use their major in that global uh, perspective. Well, let's talk a little bit more about these pathway programs. So we have a full ESL Academy at Felician. It runs all year round, small classes. Um, but this is one way where students who don't have the English requirement, maybe you just are not a good test taker. I wasn't. <laughs> Uh, you can start uh, at Felician, you can be admitted into a degree program without any TOEFL or IELTS. Uh, once you arrive to our campus, or even prior, we will test you to see what level of English you are at, and then uh, start transitioning you into taking ESL classes. And as you get higher in your English skills, then we'll start combining it with your degree program. So we do offer um, conditional admissions into your degree program if you do not have the English requirement. And these are very academic English classes. So I tell students, if you just wanna come for fun to learn English, this might not be the program for you. This is a program designed for students that want to do the, uh, get that degree, but still uh, need some more academic English skills. We also offer something very unique uh, at Felician. It's called the dual enrollment uh, uh, educational uh, diploma. We, for short, we, we use the term DEED. Um, because New Jersey uh, is one of the only states that allows students to actually gain a high school diploma without finishing high school. So students in their junior year uh, of high school, meaning their third year, um, have the opportunity to come to Felician um, earn 30 credits in a year and you get both. So you're earning credits towards a degree program and that 30 credits also qualifies you to get a U.S. high school diploma. Uh, so this is a, another kind of pathway. Uh, once you have earned a high school diploma with the 30 credits, it's kind of like doing two things at once. You have one more year left anyway for your high school education. So why not do it at college already? Um, and that allows you to um, move on to a degree program at Felician. You've tested it, you like it. It's a good uh, university for us, so we will welcome you. Or a lot of times students just move on to other universities of their choice uh, with a US high school diploma and also um, 30 credits that they can transfer towards a degree. And these are all general education classes, so every single class that you take um, will be uh, generally uh, accepted at other institutions. Uh, it's not hard to apply. We look for at least three years of high school um, and at least a minimum 2.0 GPA. And if you wanna skip kind of the ESL part, then you need to have IBT TOEFL of 65. So you can contact me more, but it's very, very popular um, uh, for students. Uh, this is a little bit about um, our programs. Like I mentioned, we were founded as a nursing school, so a, a lot of our biomedical sciences programs are very strong pre-professional programs. We also have uh, what I mentioned, you see the asterisk um, here. Let's see if I can. <laughs> well, the ones with the asterisk, we have a direct pathway into Rutgers University, which is uh, one of the top, that's top state university in New Jersey, uh, where you can do three years with us and then two years with them and graduate with a, um, a master's degree uh, in like clinical lab or uh, um, medical imaging. There's, there's a lot of pathway programs that we have with them. And we have a pre-med and pre-vet programs as well with St. George's University, a pathway with them uh, in the Caribbean. So uh, again, this isn't uncommon, this isn't Felician specific. I'm just giving you examples of what pathways look like. Many universities offer similar um, uh, kind of 
pathway or transfer agreements with other institutions. A little bit more again about Felician. Uh, we're voted one of the safest and I'm really proud of that um, because the students do have a good place to study and can feel good while they're studying. Their parents really love that. <laughs> uh, they love that uh, accolade. Um, and you know, top, top three has um, the best return on investments for our students uh, and their earnings uh, were ranked and uh, one of the best for you to get an education and then get a good pay, paying job after you graduate. But I think one of the best parts about Felician is this diversity. Um, and often, um, you know, people relate diversity just with race. Um, and we describe diversity in a much deeper way. A diversity in the uh, you know, people with disabilities, uh, older versus younger, uh, men, women. It's, uh, you know, of course, all kinds of races and um, uh, colors, I'll say. <laughs> um, so it's really quite a unique place to study uh, and, uh, you know, to learn from each other and, and from others. So and this is just more of my, our contact information. So that was a little bit about Felician. Hopefully I didn't speak too fast. Um, and if you have any questions, please yeah, join us in the chat. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jaruvi, um, for the valuable information on Felician. We are going to move on to a couple questions in, in respecting time. Uh, we appreciate you all for, for still being with us and for sharing your, your knowledge and suggestions. So one of the questions I would like to address to you three that could be a contribution to the students watching is, how can I decide what is the best type of experience for me to gain the skills I need to be competitive in my college application process. So perhaps you can give us a couple of insights. Let's start with Michael. Uh, sure, I don't think there's one answer for everybody. There, you know, just as there are many universities, um, you know, each admissions office and admissions officer looks at applications differently. Uh, we don't necessarily just take the students with the most, with the highest grades or the highest GPA or the best high schools. We're looking for interesting people. So make yourself interesting. Uh, you know, if, if there's something you did that's wonderful, be sure you include that. If you did something, if you failed at something, but learn from it, talk about that. Uh, you know, failure is, is okay. Uh, and and it's, uh, if you learn from it, you know, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. If you have initiative, leadership experiences, if you started a business, my son, when he was 16, started a business. So he's very entrepreneurial. So that was, that's very attractive, uh, you know, to, to universities. Uh, if you perform, you know, service with your church or your social organization or uh, your leader in your high school, make yourself interesting. Um, I think that's one of the best, best things you can do. So any experience that you can do locally or in the U.S. or somewhere else, uh, that makes you, I think, very attractive to an admissions officer. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, yeah, Ruby? Yeah, that's, uh, I'll echo kind of what Michael said. What I tell students, and I, I you know, kind of, we get this question, I guess, a lot. What can I do to make my application stronger? It's, it's really, we want to see your passion. We want to see what you're interested in. What makes you, you, um, you know, no two people are alike. So tell me what you're, what you're all about. What are you passionate about? There's no wrong answer. If gaming is your thing and you spend 12 hours a day gaming, and you find that a value, you know, it doesn't matter. There's no wrong answer. We want to feel that. We want to feel that beat, what makes you excited about who you are and who you want to be, perhaps. So, um, there, again, there isn't a wrong answer. It's not people say, well, I do this and this and this and I have 12 different activities. Okay, what are you passionate about? <laughs> Which one of them really makes you get up every morning or you, excites you the most? That's the one that you should be putting the time in and there, there really isn't a wrong answer. So as long as we could see that passion, that interest, and what makes you unique, you have a very good chance <laughs> of getting where, of going wherever you want to go. Awesome. And Justin, what do you think? I think my colleagues did a great job answering the question. Uh, I think I would add maybe, you know, 
you're just looking for someone who's had life experience, you know, so whether it's an after school job, whether it's uh, participating in athletics or other uh, co-curricular activities, um, or having some other um, thing that, that interests you, that, that, that that you've developed a, a hobby that's, um, you know, to a very high level. Um, so again, coming back to what Michael said, you make yourself interesting, but you do that by having had life experiences beyond just what your transcript or your test scores will show. So what admissions officers are looking for, they're looking for that whole list. They're going to review the application holistically and make sure that this is a well-rounded person that's had some success. Um, they may have had some failures as well, but they've tried different things and are out experiencing life. Um, so I think that's the, the best way to go about it. I agree with you three. <laughs> um, Michael, these two questions are probably addressed to you. <laughs> One is if you could repeat the three paths that your children took for higher education. <laughs> and the second is if you can elaborate on the virtual research opportunities. How does one apply and uh, how does it take place if it's not for, uh, on campus? Okay, well, the first question about my, my three kids, there are more than three ways to get through college and the more than three ways to get to college or into college. Uh, so there are many different paths that people take. Um, so my, my first son went to an IB program in high school and he was very academic. Uh, and he applied to several schools and was admitted to all of them. And he chose a smaller school uh, where he could be a, we say a bigger fish in a small pond. Uh, so that was kind of the traditional high achieving academic approach. And he went to a residential program. Uh, my second son, uh, my wife and I prayed that he would just finish high school. Uh, we didn't <laughs> think it after high school. Uh, he didn't like to sit still. He didn't like to sit in a class. He didn't, um, he, he, he learned through his hands and by learning and doing things. So I knew that he was not going to go to the university. Uh, uh, and he tried to go to, it when he did graduate, but he did internships throughout his high school program. He's the one who started a business uh, and started making a lot of money while he was still a high school student. And I was afraid, oh no, he won't go to school go to college at all. Um, but through his experiences, he learned a lot. And uh, he actually joined the military for a while. And then he, he did um, finished up on an online program. Uh, and then my, my other child, my daughter, uh, you know, she's taking online classes. You know, she doesn't like going to classes with a lot of strangers. She likes studying on her own and in her, her in the library or in her, her apartment. And uh, she has friends, but uh, she prefers the online approach to, to college. So uh, that's what she did and she did, did okay. Uh, it, it's not my, what I would do, but uh, as, a, as a North American parent, you know, we sometimes let our children make their own decisions and I didn't push them to do something they didn't want to do. Uh, the second um, question was about the, the research and virtual programs. It is difficult for high school students in other countries to do research. Uh, and it might not be, I mean, if you can do it, that's great, but it's not the only answer. You know, if you can do something else like the summer high school English program or, um, you know, even a, a, a vacation with your family to the Grand Canyon, you know, you can talk about that as an experience. What did you like about visiting America, etc. But if you can do something that's a little more academic, that shows that you have the capacity and the passion and the experience and you're, you're going to be successful. That's what we're looking for. So if you can do, do for example, we have a program with uh, some Chinese high schools with that meet with our high schools and we do some programs online. Uh, there are some virtual programs where um, students will do uh, uh, biotechnology uh, experiments together across uh, cultures virtually. Um, we're working with a high school in Taiwan right now uh, that they want their students to be really competitive for a U.S. college. So uh, we're talking to them and we'll, we'll be providing some, some leadership workshops and webinars and they'll get a certificate. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot of time, a lot of effort, but it shows that they did something uh, with the, a U.S. university. So, um, I mean, admissions officers are very smart. You know, they, 
they, uh, they, they know the value of the different types of experiences that you might have. Uh, so as, as Yoda, we said, you know, you know be, be passionate about it and, and be honest, be very, be very interesting. Um, but, and, and there's no one place you can go to see all of the options. You have to do your homework. Uh, go to the Education USA office, talk to your Education USA advisor. They have a lot of information. They will not tell you to go to this school or to go to that school, but if you tell them what you're interested in, they have resources. Uh, but you will have to do your homework. You'll have to, you know, get on Google and and uh, try different things and start start Googling, and you will be surprised at how many uh, different opportunities show up. And then talk to your parents. You know, talk to your your friends and your teachers in high school. They're also very good advisors. They might have some connections. Um, if you have a relative in the United States, you know, talk to your relatives. Maybe you can spend the summer with them, and they can get you to take some classes uh, at the high school or online programs in the United States or at a community college, some of which will allow high school students to take classes. So that'd be a, a, another thing that you might want to think about. Whatever your resources are. Thank you, Michael. And this next question is for Justin. So does the University of Arizona plan to establish a, a global campus on another country? That's, that's a great question. So yeah, we're definitely in plenty of conversations in, in other countries. Uh, as we're getting closer to uh, the start date for classes in August, it's, it's unlikely that there'll be other sites available for uh, at least the first trimester in August, but potentially by October and certainly by January, we'll have some additional sites uh, available, certainly in, in Mexico as well as in Central America and, and the Caribbean. So the answer is yes, uh, but nothing specific at this time that we could that we could talk about. Okay, cool. And these next two, uh, maybe Yarubi can, can help us out. They are regarding the bridge program and the dual high school degree program. So how do I enroll in a bridge program? Um, and it, does it have extra costs? And the next question is, do I stay at home to complete the dual high school degree program? Okay, so the bridge programs, um, again, is an opportunity for you to come if you are missing maybe one of the admissions requirements. Um, they often are used interchangeable with conditional admission. So we offer a bridge program, meaning that we will offer you a conditional acceptance letter, as long as you meet or do these requirements. Um, usually you have to come though to, to do the requirements at the, at the university uh, while you transition into, into your kind of degree program. So I don't know of many bridge programs, maybe my colleagues can help where you can actually start where you're doing, you know, may, maybe, maybe if, if, if there's a specific GPA requirement that you're missing, maybe you can do something at your local, but most bridge programs allow you to come start, do the prerequisites that you are missing before you transition into your degree program. And does it have an extra cost? No, no, usually it's part of the tuition cost. Uh, the only thing though, um, sometimes until you're actually, you meet those requirements, you're not eligible for maybe that scholarship you qualify for. So um, you may, it might actually be a little bit more <laughs> if you have to submit that uh, or do those requirements before you get into your degree program because the scholarship might not be uh, offered yet until you're into that degree program, but it varies from school to school. Um, for us, for example, like most of our bridge programs are English related. Um, so you'd have to complete the English level before you get into um, your degree program. Um, so it is a different cost, but it is a lower cost for English, English courses. Um, as far as the dual degree program, it is we do have uh, high school students at our university. Uh, you, um, the minimum age requirement, I forgot to mention that, is that you do have to be at least 17 to be um, uh, admitted into the program and to be part of the program. We've gotten some 16 year olds that are turning 17 within a few months of the start of the program, but for the most part, you have to be 17. Um, and I know it's a lot for parents, but it's worked very well 
for those students, you know, who are mature, um, who know that they want to uh, get into a specific university, or maybe, you know, the high school just wasn't for them anymore. They're ready to really transition into college and earn credits. Um, so we have most students that we have in that program are from China, but we have some from Taiwan and also from Spain. So it's growing, um, but it does give you the opportunity to kind of end your high school year by the time you're 17 or you finish at least three years of, of, of your high school and then start your program at the university. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yarubi. Um, and this, these next questions are open to whomever wants to take them. <laughs> So um, first one is, how will a hybrid course be listed on my transcript? Online or in person or how, how may that work? Uh, I'd say it varies from university to university because I was just in a call yesterday where I was surprised that some schools really have a rubric uh, for this online. Felicia, to be honest, doesn't, doesn't, it just lists us the course and the credits. A, on a transcript, you will never be able to tell if it was online or, or in person. But I don't know if any of my other colleagues, some universities will you know, have a, a key code in the back with a special code for the class that identifies which ones were web classes or online. Yeah. Justin? No, I, as, as, as far as I know, the University of Arizona does not make a distinction between online and face-to-face -face classes. They're, they're the same academic credit, uh, same, they're accredited by the same accrediting bodies, you know, for the academic departments. Uh, they're, they're the same. The only thing that's different is the modality. Cool. We, when students register, there is a, a, a classification, uh, the course code numbering system. Uh, it's uh, students and faculty know if it's an online course or if it's an in-person course. But there are a few programs that we have. We don't have any undergraduate online programs. We have online courses, uh, but no full bachelor's degree online. And that's intentional on our part. We do have graduate programs that are completely online uh, or completely in-person or a combination of online and in-person. Um, but most of our undergraduate students uh, we have about, about 27,000 undergraduate students. Uh, almost all of them take some of their courses as online uh, distance education uh, options. So most students will take uh, some of their courses uh, in person or online. And some courses are hybrid courses that have online requirements and occasional in-person face-to-face meetings. So again, there's so many options. Uh, uh, between universities and even within each university there's often different different types of uh, uh, programs or options to take online courses or hybrid courses or face-to-face -face courses. Awesome, thank you. And uh, do you all know if there are any search tools or search engines to find these kinds of programs similar to those that one can use to find undergraduate or graduate degrees? Uh, the search engine to find the, the, the degree programs, like... Um, oh, you mean Pathways? Do they mean Pathways? Though? Yeah. Or, or oh. online programs? or Yeah, uh, like Pathway programs, like the programs we talked about today. I'm not aware of a, uh, a neutral, unbiased, comprehensive online resource that, that, that helps you do that. There are some um, providers, you know, that will list some programs that they sponsor or they get money from, but they're not really comprehensive or unbiased. Um, I think the most unbiased source of information like that will be your Education USA advisors, but they don't have all the information either. You know, nobody has all the information. So that's why I said you really have to do some research and um, uh, use the internet. Uh, one of the nice things is all of our universities, whether they're undergraduate degree programs or short-term programs or bridge programs or pathway programs, everything is online, you know, we, because we want students to know about those as options. So uh, you can uh, put in keyword searches and you just have to start looking um, or through word of mouth, you know, find out from your friends or your, your, your teachers, uh, 
what good programs might be. And keep going to webinars like this that Education USA hosts, because if you if you attend five webinars, you're going to hear from 15 different schools, and one or two of them I think will interest you. So that, that's another good way to, to educate yourself. Yeah, Absolutely. I would just say really quick is really go for the, you know, the program research, the degree program, if that's where you want to start, you know, where you want to go, where do you want to end up? You want to go start researching the, the degree program of the school. And then, you know, if you're missing some requirements, don't give up. Ask them if they offer a pathway program. Ask, are there any other ways for me to get admitted if I didn't get in? Or, you know, what other programs do you offer that offer an alternative, alternative way? And that's really, we don't often like advertise it because uh, it's not one thing on its own. It's part of kind of, you know, a stepping stone for you to get into a degree program. So perhaps not Googling pathway, but just, start looking at the program that you want to get into or the, the degree program of the university and then see if they offer it through that, you know, different stepping stones to get into it. One, one of the pathways that we do offer at NC State is a, a one semester certificate program. Uh, so if you finish high school, uh, you can study with, with NC State for one semester and take classes in almost anything. Uh, you pay the tuition, you can live in the dormitory, um, it's an easy admission process because it's, it's our program and it doesn't have to go through the admissions office, but you get a student visa and you have one semester and you're just like a student. You pay student tuition and fees, you get courses, you get credits, you get a transcript, you get five months to try the university. Uh, you can take different courses to see if you like that or if you need some prerequisites uh, to make yourself more admissible. Most of the students who do, do that program will continue on at NC State, but some of them will go to other universities. So if you wanted to come to North Carolina for the fall semester, uh, it'll give you four or five months to improve your English, take some classes, be more competitive for an application. And if you wanna to go to Arizona or Felician or you know, Harvard, we don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you're, you're welcome to do that. You end up with a certificate and course credits, which may be transferable to another program. That will be up to the other university to decide, but uh, we have students who graduate from college overseas, and they'll do that before a graduate program, and we also have some high school students who graduate and will do this program with us as well. So it's, it's, it's not a long-term commitment, um, but it gives you some time and some experience and some uh, educational opportunities to think about what you do want to do. Um, and you might decide you love North Carolina and want to stay here, or it's too hot in North Carolina, you want to go up to Minnesota, um, uh, or take some classes at other universities. So there, there are so many different programs. But. Justin, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, I, I think that most of the options have, have been addressed by Arubian and, and, and Michael, you know, University of Arizona offers similar options. The other thing I would add, though, that that uh, our, the folks who are in attendance might want to think about is, you know, while they're still in high school, if they are doing uh, the IB program, which was mentioned, so the International Baccalaureate, and uh, they have the option of advanced placement uh, exams uh, where they can accumulate uh, academic credit uh, for those as well as, and that will be part of the admissions process. So you know, there's there's so many ways out there to uh, to to work towards a degree program, to be admitted early into a degree program. Uh, the University of Arizona has a, a program that where it's, it's really an academy, but it's really an early university program where we're partnering around the world. Those students, while they're still in high school, enroll in University of Arizona classes. Uh, to get university credit. Um, so there's certain pi partner high schools we're working with in different countries to do that and hope to expand the program. Uh, so there's a number of different ways, but I think at the end of the day, uh, the, the key takeaway is you need to talk to an enrollment counselor and certainly reach out to your Education USA uh, representative in, in your country and, and have a conversation, do your research, reach out to enrollment counselors at the institutions that you're, you're interested in. They will take the time to share those options with you. That's, that's really what they're, they're there for. They want to make sure that you choose the right path that's going to work for you, that, that makes the most of your experiences and puts you in the best position as you, go in, as you enter into college or, or university. 
Uh, there's just so many options out there. Really, you have to do the research and narrow them down. And the best way to do that is with is by talking with someone. Yes, that that idea of the best fit is so valuable and so important for you to consider from the start of your search and your journey to look for higher education in the U.S. And that's why Education USA is here to help you out. Michael, Justin, Yerubi, thank you so much for being with us. This was very, very informative and valuable information that you shared. Thank you for your time, uh, for all of you who participated. Remember, there are more events coming next week, Monday and Wednesday, the 13th and the 15th. We have events for undergraduate and graduate students to consider and evaluate if you're a good candidate for financial aid or not. So don't forget to follow us and find us on social media. Reach out to your Education USA Advising Center. You can go to educationusa.state.gov and search for your center. And my name is Maria Luisa. I'm at Education USA Guatemala. Thank you so much for being here. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good afternoon or night. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Good luck, Thank everybody. you. Have fun. Thank you.